Well, good evening. It is a privilege to welcome you to the Zacharias Institute this evening for the third event in our Trending Questions series. My name is Joe Vitali. I'm Dean of Studies here at the Zacharias Institute. And here our ministry tagline is the questions of culture, the invitation of Christ. And this Trending Questions series is really designed to sit right at the heart of that vision as at each event, a member of the RZIM team uh, will be addressing some of the most pressing, topical, important questions that our culture is asking today through the lens of the Christian worldview. And whether you're here because you are interested in engaging with these questions as a Christian or as a skeptic, you are so welcome into the conversation here tonight, and we deeply value both your presence and your questions this evening. At the first event in our series, we hosted Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford, Dr. John Lennox, who addressed the question, should we fear artificial intelligence? And then Dr. Lennox was followed by author and pastor Sam Alberry, who helped us to think through one of today's most timely and sensitive questions from a biblical perspective, how can I know my gender? And if you haven't had the opportunity to view either of those lectures, then I'd encourage you to check them out for free online. I also wanted to let you know that our next Trending Questions event will take place on September the 10th, when the phenomenal Dr. Sharon Dirks, who's an RZIM apologist and author based in the UK, she will be joining us to answer the topical question, am I just my brain? And that is also the subject of her latest book. So get that date in your diary now. It promises to be a mind-stretching and deeply insightful evening. Before then, however, we are absolutely delighted to be hosting our very own Ravi Zacharias this evening, who will be speaking to the question, where do our values come from. And Vince Vitali will be hosting a time of Q&A with Ravi after the break, during which those who are attending here in person will have the opportunity to ask your questions live at the microphone. Alternatively, both those of us who are here and those who are watching online, uh, you can submit a question through an app called Pigeonhole. And so you should be able to see the details of that on the screens now. You just go to the address www.pigeonhole.at. And once you're there, simply enter the event passcode, which is values. If you type in values, it will take you straight into the Q&A where you can both submit questions and you can vote on your favorite ones as well. And in terms of the format of the evening, the Q&A will follow on from our 20-minute break. But before then, Ravi is going to be briefly interviewed for about 10 minutes, and then after that, he will give his presentation. And I realized anew just this week how many people love to listen to Ravi all over the world when I was actually in Oxford, England, talking with somebody when another person who I didn't even know interrupted our conversation because they'd overheard me and they said, excuse me, are you the voice? And I was so confused. I didn't know what they meant for about 30 seconds, and I realized they meant the voice that introduces Ravi on the radio, uh, because they listen to him every week, and so they wanted a selfie with me, because they wanted to know there was a face that went with the voice. Um, but, you know, it is an honor this evening to actually have the chance to introduce him in person for once. Uh, but when it comes to considering our values, I truly actually cannot think of a better person to speak to this question than Ravi Zacharias. And I say this in part because as an Easterner who's lived in the West, for decades, and who regularly traverses the globe to speak in all manner of contexts, Ravi has a unique insight into the many diverse forms and expressions of human value all across the world. You know, far more importantly, this is not primarily an academic question for Ravi. Rather, he's interested in the question of human values, because actually, more than nearly anybody else I know, he's somebody who values humans, and not just the types of people that our society tends to typically value. In the course of his travels, Ravi meets and engages with all sorts of people, um, but I think it's no coincidence that I have never seen him so alive, so engaged, so comfortable and at home as he was when a group of us visited a project funded by Wellspring International, the humanitarian arm of RZIM, which houses, feeds, and cares for destitute elderly who had been abandoned in the streets to beg or to die. 
and watching Ravi take every person there by the hand and look into their eyes and just offer them words of hope and in comfort and encouragement. Uh, it became so abundantly clear to me exactly where Ravi's values really do lie and where his heart is. In the words of Ravi himself, love is the strongest apologetic. And so Ravi, it is an honor uh, to hear from you this evening. Please do come and join me. Good evening, Ravi. It's so good to have you here with us tonight. And um, I just have a few questions for you before we hear from you, because um, I know people have read your books and heard you on the radio, but it's nice to have a chance just to get to know you a little bit more personally first. And, and so my first question is, obviously, you were born in Chennai in southern India, and then you were raised in the north in Delhi. Um, but as someone who grew up in that context, can you tell us a bit about what were the values of that culture that had the strongest impression on you during your childhood. May I begin then by apologizing for my voice. Uh, as you heard, I had this surgery on Tuesday, and I think this is the lingering effect of the anesthetic. I have no other explanation for it. I began to lose it the day before yesterday. It was getting worse and worse, so today I just have exercised it a bit. Uh, but don't be fearful. I hope as I'm using it, it'll just uh, get the vocal cords accustomed to speaking again. Uh, I'm not in any pain. I am just uh, don't have the strength of voice that I thought I would have. So thank you for your understanding. Uh, Joe, I've got some news for you too. I was asked while I was traveling this week, is that your daughter whose voice we hear <laughs> on the radio? So uh, I told them, no, she's married to a wonderful colleague of mine, and Vincent and Joe lead our ministry here. Values, I never thought of them. You know, never gave it a thought uh, growing up. You sort of Im imbibe it in the Eastern culture. You just uh, grow accustomed to, the, accustomed to the values that you see your parents uh, talking about or your parents encouraging you to do. And the same is carried on in the school, the teachers and the friends. The Indian culture is uh, far from being monolithic. In one sense, it is. 80% being Hindu. But then you've got the, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Sikhs, the Jains, and the Christians as well. Uh, the basic values are allegiance to family, mm -hmm. uh, truth-telling, uh, excelling in your school, and uh, basically avoiding hurting anybody else. Uh, not that we abided by that, but that's what you really uh, get into your system of thought, but to think of it as something we studied and learned never crossed my mind till really I became a follower of Jesus Christ. Mm. And from what I understand, one of your primary values was playing cricket. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> which I can respect as a Brit yeah. as well. <laughs> and food, and food. Yeah. And food, <laughs> yes, which hasn't changed to this day. Ravi is a connoisseur of the best food at Waffle House, by the way, in case, you, in case you're not sure where to go and what to order off the menu. Um, but Ravi, you, you've spoken numerous times about how you became a Christian as a teenager, actually on a bed of suicide in a hospital in Delhi. And um, could you tell us a little bit about what it was at that time in your life that led you to believe that actually life wasn't valuable enough to keep on living? And, and, and yeah. then what changed for you when you did become a Christian? Well, actually, for many, many years, my wife's in the audience here, too. She would let, tell you that I never wanted to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, in a culture of shame, to fail at that was a disastrous thing. Although a few of my friends succeeded and uh, I had wanted to go. But my reason was not any kind of aberrant psyche or whatever it was. I wasn't doing well in my studies. I wasn't working hard at my studies in distinction to my brothers and sisters and my friends. I really loved uh, the sporting field to the core. You put a cricket bat in my hand or a cricket ball in my hand and that's all I really wanted to live for. The strange thing is at that time, cricket wasn't a professional sport 
There were no such things as professional cricketers. You worked at another profession, and when the international matches came, they would select it, somebody from the railways or the government or a teacher or whatever. They would take the best of the players. India would play England or New Zealand or Pakistan or the West Indies, uh, Australia. They were the biggest teams at that time. But because I was so focused on playing cricket, I was neglecting my studies. And when my dad looked me in the eye and made the comment, one day you're going to bring such shame to our family, and my dad was a very successful man. I think he was trying to waken me up out of my lethargy. I don't think he intended to be mean, although he was a pretty vicious-tempered man when he lost it. That told me uh, I was persona non grata in the family, that I was not the kind of son he'd really wanted to have. So that took me on the path of suicide, and it is amazing to me that God protected me, but not only protected me, rescued me from the very reason that drove me to that bed. That's the amazing intervention of divine grace and divine providence uh, for my needs. So there I was at the age of 17 and uh, never looked back. From that day till this, uh, I have never even doubted uh, my calling before Jesus Christ because I know I never sought him, but he pursued me. I never thought of him, but he thought of me. I never thought of salvation, but he knew that's what I needed. So that's what happened on that bed of suicide when I was 17 years old. I think we see the consistency of that lived out in your life. Remember, you, you, you commented in that moment saying, you know, Lord, if you come into my life, I will leave no stone unturned in pursuit of truth. And right. how many decades later that has right. stayed true? It's true of you. I, I imagine it was quite a shock then when you moved to Canada early in your 20s and, right. and, and the sort of clash of cultural values you experienced. Right. then. how would you say the West immediately struck you as different in, in, in its values from the East? The West of then is very different to the West of now. Mm. Sadly, I think there were some value structures, there were some uh, frameworks within which you could operate in the ethical realm. I was in the hospitality industry. I was 20 years old, my brother, older brother Jeet was 22, and we uh, moved over. Uh, he got a job immediately with IBM and worked with them many years till he started his own business, now long retired. Uh, but I went into the hospitality industry, but I knew the hunger in my heart. Things had changed mm -hmm. by the time I had reached there, and I wondered if this is what I... I wanted to do business. I'm not sure I was qualified, but that's really what I wanted to do. And so during the... I got a job working nights, mm -hmm. uh, about 6 p.m. till 3 a.m. in the morning, and uh, so that I could go to school during the day and pay my way through some theological training. My dad had no idea I was into this. My brother wondered what on earth was going on. I started attending a theological school, just fell in love with the scriptures, fell in love with great theological thoughts and the philosophy of religion and all. That began my path. And then finally in 68, two years after we arrived, I formally let go of that other career and went into theological training in Toronto. Mm. And Ravi's life really is an incredible story. If you haven't had the chance to read Walking from East to West, it's, it's a really phenomenal book, which will give you much more detail than we have time for tonight. One last question for you, Ravi. Now, uh, you've been doing this for around five decades. You, um, you have some incredible grandchildren that you're a grandfather to, and you also lead a team of, of young evangelists as well all across the globe. And uh, would you say there are certain things you've come to value in this stage of life now that, that you hadn't before? Many things. The gift of a voice, you take it for granted. You never know whether you'll have it. Uh, and with a back that has had two major surgeries and uh, had struggles on the road, uh, I'm just grateful for the strength of God all the way. But if I were to narrow them down to three or four things, it would be my wife and our children. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> because yeah. I would never, Margie is here somewhere, uh, I would never have been able to do what I did if I had not somebody who was twice as dedicated as I am because her calling is of greater sacrifice than mine is. You know, when you're on the road, you're facing the headwinds, whether you like it or not, the adrenaline is being pumped. You're facing the audiences, you're studying, you're preparing, and you're actually getting to see a better part of the world. 
But Margie was at home raising the kids and never complained. The only time she complained was if I was doing it for reasons other than just going to preach, which I really didn't do much of. I mm -hmm. never held a golf club in my hands. I loved tennis, but uh, I had to give that up when I ended up with a broken back. So if it's just for the whimsical thing, I did a trip, uh, then she'd say, what are, you, what are you doing this for? You're already <laughs> been traveling quite a bit. So all of my buddies here, beware when you ask me out to just go and have a good time somewhere. So my wife and then the sacrifice of my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you live in a glass house. Uh, when you're in the public eye, you get it. But I made the commitment long before that I knew some of the things that would take place and I was committed to Christ. And one of the things I learned from Billy Graham was stay focused on him mm -hmm. and uh, let the chips fall where they may. So grateful for the privilege, my family, and for great mentors mm -hmm. who have, re my, my professor whom I just buried, uh, I spoke at his funeral, Norman Geisler. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable that a man of his extraordinary intellectual depth took a liking for me. I'm not, I don't belong on the same platform with him, but that he poured himself into me personally. This is all of God. And now working with my colleagues, you know, it's a wonderful team to work alongside. A very devoted team. I learn a lot from everybody traveling around. So it's been a blessed life. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. And you and Margie really are mentors to the rest of us. So thank you for the way that you model family life and marriage. Uh, if you'd like the opportunity to ask Ravi more questions tonight, please do remember to sign into pigeonhole.at using that passcode values, and you can submit your questions there. Ladies and gentlemen, Ravi Zacharias. Thank you so much. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, and that was good. It gave my vocal cords a chance to warm up. So as far as I'm concerned, they already sound better uh, than I did before. I was just keeping very quiet, hoping they would strengthen, but a little bit of exercise of it uh, is not uh, uh, counterproductive. I'm very glad that you did that, Joe. And Joe and Vince direct the Institute along with Sean and their team. Uh, they are just wonderful directors here uh, traveling where tomorrow Vince and I and Joe and I actually, three of us and a few others, leave tomorrow to upstate New York where I begin a week of meetings uh, speaking there at a conference that I've been going to for nearly 40 years. I have nothing left to say, but they still keep inviting me. So I sit on the plane and beg the Lord to give me a few new thoughts and a few new illustrations. So thank God for grandchildren who give you more illustrations by the day. Where do we get our values from? On the way here, I was, my wife was driving me and I said, I'm not the right person for a subject as profound as this. Uh, Vince has a master's in philosophy and his PhD in philosophy and theology. He'd be far more qualified to address this and so would some of the other teammates. But when they asked me to speak on this, I'm assuming they asked me to speak on it from the view of my perspective, how I see the source of our values and what the idea of values really mean. You know, the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that the debate on this issue has been going back for aeons of time. Every culture has wrestled between the difference of what is and what ought. I'm going to read for you two, two little narratives. The first you may be familiar with, and I don't do it just to be humorous, I do it to prove a point. And the second one is far more serious on a philosophical basis. So pardon me if you're familiar with this, but I have a reason for it. Well, Sam, will you tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan? Yes, sir, I will, sir. Once there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked him. And as he went on, he didn't have any money, and so he met the Queen of Sheba, and she gave him a thousand talents of gold and a thousand changes of raiment. And he got into a chariot and drove furiously. And when he was driving under a big juniper tree, his hair caught on the limb of that tree. And he hung there many days. And the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. <laughs> One night when he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah come along and cut off his hair 
and he dropped and fell on stony ground. But he got up and went on and began to rain and rain 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave and he lived on locusts and wild honey. Then he went on till he met a servant who said, come take supper at my house. And he made excuse and said, no, I won't. I've married a wife and I can't go. And the servant went in the highways and the hedges and compelled him to come in. After supper, he went on and come on down to Jericho. And when he got there, he looked up and saw that old queen Jezebel sitting way up high on a window. And she laughed at him and he said, throw her down out there. And they threw her down. And he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down again, 70 times seven. And of the fragments that remained, they picked up 12 baskets full besides women and children. And they said, blessed are the peacemakers, P-I-E-C-E. Now, whose wife do you think she will be on that judgment day? (laughs) Brilliant. But you have to know your Bible to see what a mess he's made of a story. One of the fine writers on moral reasoning is a man by the name of Alastair McIntyre. After virtue and prior to that, he'd written Whose Justice, Which Rationality? And may I mention two other books, Is Man the Measure by Dr. Geisler and Ethics, Alternatives and Issues by Norman Geisler. Now, this is a bit more convoluted because he's using a completely different illustration to prove the same point I have just made about the scriptures. And here's what he says. Imagine if the natural sciences were to suffer the effects of a catastrophe. A series of environmental disasters are blamed by the general public on the scientists. Widespread riots occur, laboratories are burned down, physicists are lynched, books and instruments are destroyed. Finally, a know-nothing political movement takes power and successfully abolishes science teaching in schools and universities, imprisoning and executing the remaining scientists. Later still, there is a reaction against this destructive movement, and enlightened people will seek to revive science, although they have largely forgotten what it was. But all that they possess are fragments, a knowledge of experiments detached from any knowledge of the theoretical context which gave them significance. Parts of theories unrelated to each other, bits and pieces of theory which they possess possess, or to experiment. Instruments whose use has been forgotten, half chapters from books, single pages from articles, not always fully legible because torn and charred. Nonetheless, all these fragments are re-embodied in a set of practices which undergo the revived names of physics, chemistry, and biology. Adults argue with each other about the respective merits of relativity theory, evolutionary theory, although they possess only a very partial knowledge of each. Children learn by heart the surviving portions of the periodic table and recite as incantations some of the theorems of Euclid. Nobody or almost nobody realizes that what they are doing is not natural science in any proper sense at all, for everything that they do and say conforms to certain canons of consistency and coherence and those contexts which would be needed to make sense of what they are doing and uh, of what they are doing have been lost perhaps irretrievably. What is the point of my constructing this imaginary world inhabited by the fictitious pseudoscientists and real genuine philosophy? The hypothesis which I wish to advance is that in the actual world which we inhabit, the language of morality is in the same state of grave disorder as the language of natural science in the imaginary world which I described. What we possess, if this view is true, are fragments of a conceptual scheme, parts which now lack those contexts from which their significance derived. We possess, indeed, a notion of morality. We continue to use many of the key expressions, but we have very largely, if not entirely, lost our comprehension, both theoretical and practical, of morality. This is how McIntyre begins his work on the the struggle for virtue and his history is a sweeping expose or going all the way back to Aristotle and coming down to more recent times of nihilism a la Nietzsche or the emptiness and meaninglessness of existentialist philosophers. I think it's a very powerful illustration that he has given to us of the fragmentary state in which we find our ethical world.
Let me give you an illustration that may be a bit provocative, but I think it makes the point. Imagine today when you see and talk to medical doctors debating the issue of abortion, where some may hold the view, and some are advocating the view, that this can even be done little after the child is born. So even a medical practitioner can enter into that terrain of saying, we have a right to do this, don't we? Now, I know that's a thorny illustration, but why do I give that? Just this week, a story broke of the one man who remained silent from the uh, smuggling out of Adolf Eichmann in the 60s from Argentina back to Jerusalem. We all know some of the names, uh, Peter Malkin and the others from the Mossad who are involved in that cloak and dagger operation, got into Argentina, spotted where he lived, and through binoculars and all, somehow tracked him down. And the whole scheme is written in the book, The House on Garibaldi Street. It's a brilliant narrative. But what that narrative tells you is when they finally got him, one key person had a syringe in his hand in the car, jabbed it into Eichmann's arm, and rendered him almost unconscious, but not completely unconscious. They had to give just the right amount of that anesthetic so that he could be a zombie obeying orders, but not able to ask any questions. They rendered him in that halfway house of being totally unconscious to making complete sense. They put on him a uniform of a pilot for El Al and took him in on a stretcher and loaded him on the plane in order to bring him back for trial in Jerusalem. The one man who never said anything about the whole process was the doctor that gave him the injection until recently. And he, he died at the age of 91. And his son kept saying to him, why dad? Why did you never ever say a word about the critical role you played without which they would never have brought him here? And he shocked his son. He said, when I took the Hippocratic Oath, I took the oath not to harm anybody. And as I was called upon to play this role, what was struggling in my mind was, am I doing well as a doctor? to render this man semi-conscious, or is it outweighing in my heart the death of millions of my fellow countrymen at the behest and order of this man? Just think of how ethics has changed, how values have changed. Here is a man thinking of an oath he had made as a medical pr practitioner. Today, when we talk about life and death issues, those oaths have nothing to do anymore with the decisions we make, either in politics or in medicine, or for that matter, in many other professions of our kind. If you look at the old oaths that engineers took, when they were given an engineering license, my father-in-law was a chemical engineer, and he showed me the oath that he had to take. Every oath had a moral framework given to it that they would do what was honorable. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do now is do two or three things because of the limitation of time. The first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about some middle ground that the Christians have with the humanistic worldview. And by the way, humanism is not monolithic. There are at least six or seven types of humanistic systems that you can think of, from uh, Marx and Feuerbach on the one side to Ayn Rand on the other, and you can go right down to situation ethics. And all of these, we think humanism is monolithic. It is not. The egocentric humanism of Ayn Rand is very different to the ethics of and the humanism of Marx and uh, the Mao Lenin doctrine and so on. So, but there are one or two things most of humanity has come to terms with as legitimate categories which are actually worth interacting on and discussing. 
unless you're a little bit like Richard Dawkins, who ultimately dismisses the category of evil. But at least one can say honestly, he has probably wrestled with it and thought about it. So the first thing I want to say to you is the reality and the mystery of evil. Here we have a category that Christians elaborate upon and humanists actually hint at or struggle with. When Ronald Reagan called the former Soviet Union an evil empire, you'd think that he'd sort of broken a different kind of wall of international geopolitical communication, but that's exactly what he said. And when he said Mr. Gorbachev pulled down that wall, he saw the oppressiveness of that ideology as being so evil and that wall had to come down. But here is what I say to you. Psychiatrists wrestle with this. What does the term really mean? Some years ago, Benedict Carey wrote an article called in the New York Times, for the worst of us, the diagnosis may be, in quotes, evil. Predatory killers often do far more than commit murder. Some have lured their victims into homemade chambers for prolonged torture. Others have exotic tastes for vivisection, sexual humiliation, and burning. Many perform their grisly rituals as much for pleasure as for any other reason. Among themselves, a few forensic scientists have taken to thinking of these people as not merely disturbed, but evil. Evil in that their deliberate, habitual savagery defies any psychological explanation or attempt at treatment. Most psychiatrists assiduously avoid the word evil, contending that its use would precipitate a dangerous slide from clinical to moral judgment. Isn't it interesting? That line itself is a moral judgment. That they don't want to slide into making moral judgments that could put people on death row unnecessarily and obscure the understanding of violent criminals. And why would that be wrong? Because you dare not execute somebody unjustly, which is moral reasoning. See, it's woven into the fabric of why they don't even want to talk about it, but assume it all along. And then he, she, he goes on to say, many career forensic examiners say they're for work forces them to reflect on the concept of evil, and some acknowledge they can find no other term for certain individuals they have evaluate. And then they form a kind of a, a hierarchy of how to arrive at the word evil. We are talking about people, says one psychiatrist, who commit breathtaking acts, who do so repeatedly, who know what they're doing and are doing it in peacetime under no threat to themselves, said Dr. Michael Stone, the Columbia psychiatrist, who has examined several hundred killers at various centers where he consults and teaches. We know from experience who these people are and how they behave, and it is time to give their behavior the proper appellation. See, for some acts, Evil is the only description. We were recently at a prison, one of the deadliest places in America to be years ago, but so much has changed that 85% of them are on life without parole. A couple of my colleagues who were here, Vince was there with me, Sanj, and we were walking past death row. It's a very sobering place to be. And we never asked why they were on death row. We just threw the bars, put our hands, shook hands with them, prayed with them. And I tell you, just hearing them talk about the need for prayer and listening one voice bellowing from three cells down, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We walked out of there, and then I learned the first guy with whom I held both hands and prayed what he had done to get on to death row. If I described it to you, you would actually think I'm exploiting your emotions and straining you to a point of horror. But that's the way it was. And so what they're saying is, yes, there are some preconditions for some. There are some issues in which these things can happen. But for some, the description is fitting to say evil. And when you go back, to the case of Eichmann, Rudolf Hess, in his journal, talks about when they made the decision to start gassing people. 
I was not properly conscious of the first gassing of human beings, Rudolf Hurst says. Perhaps the procedure as a whole made too much of an impression on me. I remember much better the gassing of 900 Russians soon afterwards in the old crematorium using Block 11 would have caused too much trouble. While they were still being unloaded, several holes were simply knocked through the earth and cement ceiling of the morgue. The Russians had to undress in the outer room and they all went quite calmly into the morgue since they'd been told they were going to be deloused there. The whole transport walked right into the morgue. The door was locked and the gas poured in through the openings. How long the killing took, I do not know. The hum could still be heard for quite a while, however. When it was thrown in, some people cried, gas, and a great roaring began and a rush to both doors. They withstood the pressure, however. After several hours, the room was opened and aired out. Then I saw the gassed corpses en masse for the first time. But I must be frank, this gas gassing had a calming effect on me since the mass extermination of the Jews was about to begin and neither Eichmann nor myself knew what method of killing might be used or the expected masses. Now we had discovered the gas and the procedure as well. Educated people. I've been to that very room. You see, there is no other description. But this is where the Christian begins to depart from merely the appellation evil. The Christian moves into the first very narrative when Cain was told, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. May as well say evil, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. Sin is a choice that you make. Evil becomes the result that then overtakes and overwhelms you. The mere seeking of the destruct destruction of somebody else goes beyond just sin. It becomes actually evil. And when you think of what happened in Rwanda with the hundreds of thousands and I, one of the world leaders went flew in by plane and... Uh, told them to keep the engines running because he wasn't going to stay long. He walked in there, saw the horror, and walked out of there saying, I didn't know this was what was happening. The Canadian general heading up the NATO forces said this, you didn't know? I've spent my life in NATO. I know NATO planes were overhead and knew. I'm haunted by dreams by the eyes of thousands and thousands of Africans disembodied, staring out of the African darkness. You can't just walk away from something like that saying you did what you could. You can't just Pontius Pilate 800,000 people. But here it is, what David Hume said in his dialogues concerning natural religion. My colleague Os Guinness points all of this out. Man is the greatest enemy of man. Jean-Jacques Rousseau in Emile, seek the author of evil no longer, it is yourself. Voltaire, after the Lisbon earthquake, writing to a Protestant pastor, I pity Portuguese people like you, but men still do more harm to each other on the, their little molehill than nature does to them. Our wars massacre more men than are swallowed up by earthquakes. You see, you can't just keep it at an abstract notion of evil. It has to come down to the human heart. So the logical connection for the Christian, we get our values from the nature of what evil really is. It is engineered by the will and the whim of man. Can you really talk about evil? That's the question I have. Without assuming an absolute moral framework, and can you really talk about education without first looking inside the human heart? Do you hear what I raised as a question? Can you really talk about evil without assuming an absolute moral framework? And can you talk of education without first looking inside the human heart? So for us, and from my worldview as a Christian, I look at the preponderance and the reality of evil, and I say, that while the world is now agreeing that evil is a category, the Christian has a way of pointing why evil actually comes about. 
that's where humanists will never go. They don't like to take the logical outworking of a category and place it with human responsibility and the nature of what humanity is all about. So from my point of view, the, as uh, Norman Geisler used to say humorously, the problem wasn't the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground. <laughs> it's really not as just one little thing after another and taking the fruit of the tree. That is a simplistic way of explaining it away. The second thing on which we humans, we agree with humanists is the ultimate hunger for love. The ultimate hunger for love. And as I say to you, while evil is on one side on which we agree and struggle that it is real, on the other side is the hunger and reality of love. You know, it's fascinating. I come from a culture where in my generation, you never ever heard your parents tell each other, I love you. It was too blunt a statement to make. My brother-in-law, Sundar, who came to know the Lord very close to my time and went into ministry, his father died when he was 85, and he called his wife to his bedside. My sister and brother-in-law told me this. As he was dying, this Orthodox Hindu Brahmin man made his turn to Jesus Christ on that deathbed during Canadian Thanksgiving. It's a remarkable story. And then he looked at his wife and said, in all the years I've been married to you, which is over 50, I have never called you my sweetheart. I want to call you that now. It was incredible how love, love, found its anchor. In 2005, during the Super Bowl, one of the women Marines said she was on a rooftop when a grenade hit and she lost her arm. She gave her interview during the Super Bowl intermission. And as she was lying in the ambulance being taken, she kept sobbing. They says, are you hurting really bad? She said, no. I've lost my wedding ring in that. My wedding ring is with the hand that has been lost. And one of the guys in a cloak and dagger operation managed to get back to the rooftop, find that hand, and brought it back. And she was flashing that ring across the television waves to show somebody that that was what she was weeping for, not just a lost arm. When you hear stories of the splendor of love, you understand it is the longing of the human heart. And so, even humanists will talk about love as the supreme ethic and evil as the worst kind of description. But they do not have the framework in which to actually give the answers. So, with time running out, how does the Bible deal with this? I want to give you three sets of postulates here. Number one, the Bible gives us the created description of Imago Dei, the image of God. Our values come right from the beginning with the intrinsic worth that God gives to you and me. So the first thing I say to you is intrinsic worth and reflective splendor. The book of Genesis gives us intrinsic worth and reflective splendor. Number two, in the image of God, he created the male and female. Diversity in form, unity in worship. Diversity in form, unity in worship. Number three, the sovereignty of the creator and the stewardship to us over creation. God is sovereign over us. We are stewards over creation. Intrinsic worth, reflective splendor. Diversity in form, unity in worship. Sovereignty of the creator, stewardship of our creation. Four, theonomy of life, autonomy of the individual. God's law is the umbrella under which we live. The individual choice and privilege is given to you and me to either receive that law and live by its impact or reject the law 
and live by the consequences. We are given the freedom to choose. We are not given the freedom to sever the entailments. We are given the freedom to choose. We are not given the freedom to sever the consequences. Number two. What happened in the garden was of one law, a one law world that God created. This is critical. In the day that you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And the tempter comes and says, no, you will be as God, knowing good and evil. What he was really saying was, go ahead and play God. Go ahead and play God. Look at the chaos in which we now live all over the world because we've played God. There's no more a theonomous framework. I'm not talking about a theocratic framework. A theocratic framework would be the state enforcing a religion which will never succeed and is not, it was not even designed by God in that way. And wherever theocracies have been, the church has suffered huge loss because people began to rebel and reject an enforced belief system. So what happened when we defied God was a rejection of his sovereignty and the inheritance of death. But something fascinating emerges. Man is now hiding, not God. We talk so much theologically of the hiddenness of God, but the reality it's the hidingness of man. When man is hiding and God says to them, who told you? You are naked. Because man's conscience now causes him to hide. The problem in this world, Bertrand Russell says, you know, when they ask me why I didn't believe in him, I'll tell him he didn't give me enough evidence. The fact of the matter is, it's not the absence of evidence, it's the suppression of it. Romans 1 makes that very clear. Rejection of his sovereignty, inheritance of death, the hiddenness of man, and shame from within. Number three, attacking the image and bleeding the family when Cain killed Abel. He violated the image of God, not just killed his brother. It was a direct attack upon the Imago Dei, hence Genesis 9-6, which talks about what happens when you kill somebody? Four, man became a restless wanderer and enslavement of the ultimate kind within. He became a restless wanderer and enslavement of the ultimate kind. What happens? God's ra God raised up a deliverer. God provided the miracle of freedom. God gave them the law and fulfilled it in love. And here's the most important truth. Jesus Christ didn't come into this world to make bad people good. He didn't come to make us more moral. Yes, Calvin has a point in the third use of the law where we to be civil with each other. But that's not the ultimate use of the law. You see, the law is like a mirror. It tells you your face is dirty, but you don't go and rub your face against the mirror to clean it. You have to go to the faucet. The key peg of the Ten Commandments is this peg. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only worldview where redemption precedes righteousness. That's where I get my values from recognizing the evil in my own heart that I don't deserve this grace and this mercy and yet God comes and picks me up and puts a new song in my heart and reminds me that the hunger and the love for the law that he has given me is not because I naturally love the law because in loving God I know there is no contradiction in him and the moral law is a reflection of who God is. There is no lie in him. There is no contradiction in him. And I love the law because of whose law it is. Now let me tell you this. 
people say, ah, so yours is the divine command theory. Oh my, oh my. See, ethics comes under two broad categories. The deontological ones, where things are good in themselves, or the teleological ones, that which is given for a purpose. That which are good in themselves, and that which is given for a purpose. And so utilitarianism moves into the teleological side of purpose. God brings the two together. It is essentially good and rightly observed is for the greater purpose. What is the greater purpose? Communion with the living God. So we are created by God for a purpose. That's the telos. We are given the law of God to define what the oughtness is. But we know full well we cannot reach that oughtness. And only God through his grace and forgiveness. And putting his Holy Spirit within us. Gives us that hunger and thirst after righteousness. I want to close for you with two little illustrations. That I think if you ask me are myself so beautiful these two illustrations can really be put together I just put them together today my research assistant was wonderfully helpful in the second part of it I don't know if you're here Danielle but I thank God for you Apollo 8 December 24 1968 Anders Lovell and Frank Borman go around the dark side of the moon December 24 1968 what do they do which nobody was aware of? They read for us from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. So from the dark side, from the other side of the moon, you're going to come these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. July 24th, 1969, where Collins, Holden, and Armstrong are setting their feet on the the terrain of the moon. Listen to what Aldrin said. Houston, this is Eagle. This is the LM pilot speaking. I would like to request a few minutes of silence. I would like to invite each person listening in, wherever and whomever he may be, to contemplate for a moment the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his own individual way. For me, this meant taking communion. In the radio blackout, I opened the little plastic packages which I brought, which contained the bread and wine. I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given to me. In the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the wine curled slowly and gracefully up the side of the cup. It was interesting to think that the very first liquid ever poured on the moon and the first food ever eaten there were communion elements. Think about it. They go thousands of miles away looking at the speck back home. What do they call for? Silence so that they could commune with the Creator who made the heavens and the earth. Apollo 8, in the beginning. Apollo 11, for this purpose of communion. Where do we get our values from? For God, who made us for a purpose, so that we might have fellowship with him. No other world tells a story like this. If you fragment it, it becomes a mockery. You put it together and you find out he has made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. We get our values, most importantly, from the most valuable entity in existence who has created us and poured that value and significance into your life and mine. That's how we find out why we are here and how we finally get to have that communion. Every other view talks about is, doesn't know how to get us to ought. It is all an abstraction. Here it is personal. What a beautiful story the gospel is. God bless you.
Thank you so much, Ravi. I, I find it astonishing that even on a day when uh, his vocal cords are bothering him, he still manages to get more profundity and insight and power into 30 minutes of talking than I can manage in at least a year. Um, but I, I know he's given us a lot to mull over there, um, a lot of richness uh, to consider. I always find that, uh, that refreshment helps me to process things. So we're going to take a 20-minute break now. If you have questions that have been stirred up, please do submit them on Pigeonhole. Uh, if you're here in person, please do check out the art gallery and the bookstore, and we'll be back together in 20 minutes. Thank you. Questions are not getting eliminated every day. Questions haunt our lives every day. And the question of origin, the question of meaning, the question of morality, and the question of destiny. These four converge into a worldview. We all think about these issues within our own context and parameters. God has given this team the opportunity and the platform in many settings to be able to address the questions of our time. So I ask you to just get onto our website, find out what it is that ministers to your need the best. It'll equip you to answer questions, but more important than that, we hope, draw you closer and closer into your walk with Jesus Christ. And that's what we intend to do here at RZIM, address the issues of our time and the worldviews that shape people's lives. The RZIM Academy was born out of Ravi's vision for creating an online training program. At the time, we were offering great in-person training in places like the OCCA in Oxford, England, or summer programs in specific cities in the US, Canada, and India. But what about those who can't get to those places? Then we started the Academy. I'm not sure we realized how much interest there would be but we're celebrating five years since we launched our first course, and the response has been overwhelming. From the first lecture in, in the core module, I was, I was all in because I knew it was exactly what I needed to strengthen my personal relationship with Christ, to ground me in my faith so that I was able to not only demonstrate what it means to be a Christian, but also defend it. Just the, the wealth of the information presented and the way in which it was conducted, the heart behind the program really made an impact in, in my life. Was ich persönlich besonders gut an der Zaharias Akademie finde, ist, dass sie mich dafür sensibilisiert, meinen Gesprächspartner ernst zu nehmen und ihn wertzuschätzen. Es geht in Gesprächen ja nicht nur darum, auf Fragen zu antworten, sondern einer Person zu begegnen, die hinter der Frage steht. At first I thought this is an academic challenge for me, but uh to my surprise, it was something that really changed and transformed the way I, I view evangelism, the way I view Christianity. We've now enrolled more than 10,000 students from more than 130 different countries. We have courses in four languages, 
We have a growing list of elective courses on topics like Islam, suffering, the Bible, science, what it means to be human, with more being produced each year. I think a lot of people will find it helpful. A lot of people will find it that you may push them to, to reach out to others. Uh, you'll probably reach people you never imagined you can reach before uh, or even talk to. And I feel it's the skills um, and that confidence that we know not only what to say and how to say it and how to relate to others uh, with the gospel. The feedback and stories we hear from students has been tremendous. And we're really encouraged to continue to build this program and watching how God uses it all over the globe. This is the task of Christian apologetics, whether it be in debate, whether it be in argument, whether it be in defense, whether it be in confirmation. It is ultimately to present the person of Jesus Christ and who he is. Set apart that Christ in your heart and always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within you and do that with gentleness and respect. RZIM Connect is the online home for the global RZIM family. It's a place where you can interact with people around the world, enjoy great conversations, and grow in your faith. RZIM Connect is more than a message board. We have over 30 members of our team committed to answering your questions for a week at a time throughout the year. Ask any question from anywhere. No matter where you are, RZIM Connect can go with you. We're bringing our team to you through RZIM Connect. There is no cost for RZIM Connect. It is completely free. Building this community is our gift to you. Signing up is easy and should take less than a minute. Go to rzimconnect.org today. Sign up and introduce yourself. That's rzimconnect.org. We'll see you soon. There's a sense of momentum here in RZM building around our outreach to youth. I don't like to think of the young as just the power of tomorrow. They are also the ones today who are having such a huge influence all over the globe. And so I think this age is extremely important because as we've been encouraged during this time frame to be able to make decisions about so many things in life, we also are looking inwards at 
What do we believe about our existence here? We have three events which are part of our bigger youth initiative specifically for high school students. Starting with the 12 to 18 age bracket, we have an event called Reboot. Reboot is our global youth apologetics outreach day. The hashtag for Reboot is no question off limits. It's a day packed with short talks, interviews, discussion forums, Q&A forums, where really students leave not only with more confidence, but also students who do not know Christ. Some, many actually, leave encountering Christ. Then we have an event for a slightly older age bracket, 17 to 24, called Remind. We have breakout sessions where all it is is Q&A. There's tons of time for interaction as well. So you're not just hearing the speakers on the stage, but you're interacting with them one-on-one. -on -one. We want to equip young adult Christians to not only have their minds transformed by the truth of the gospel, but to be able to transform the minds around them. Next, we have Refresh. Refresh is a four-day intensive course for those who are upperclassmen or for those who are simply thinking about college. A challenge can be so different if you know that it's coming, if you're not just surprised by it and intimidated by it, but if you know it's coming and you're prepared and you're equipped for it, a challenge can even be a good thing. A challenge can even be something that pushes one's faith further forward. The whole um, principle of the program is to welcome students' questions, to affirm them for having them, to affirm them for asking them. Asking questions is the way that you get to know anyone. It's the way that relationship deepens with a person. And so that's the same for God. That's the same with Jesus Christ. It's only by asking our hard questions about Him, but also to Him, that our relationship with Him grows. One of the distinguishing factors of all three events, Reboot, Remind, Refresh, is that they're strongly evangelistic, but also empowering for the believer. We want to help the thinker believe, but also help the believer think. All three events are a safe space, safe place for any audience, irrespective of belief, to come and find meaningful answers to tough questions. The cultural landscape for youth is complex and daunting. We at RZM count it a privilege to respond to the tough questions that youth have. We hope to see you here of one of our events. On Thursday, September 19th, we'll be hosting Reboot Las Vegas. Reboot is a day for students between the age of 12 to 18 to come and ask their big questions of faith. Topics including science, the Bible, sex and relationships. What is truth? Why is there so much evil? And, and what does God have to say about it? To asking the most fundamental question of all, who is God? I'll be joined by a world-class group of speakers from the RZAM Global Speaking Team. Speakers will include Vince Vitale, Michelle Tepper, and David Bennett. We are thrilled to be hosting Reboot Las Vegas with our friends at Calvary Chapel. To register, please go to rebootglobal.org slash Las Vegas. This is not a day to be missed. If you are between the ages of 12 to 18, we would love to see you there.
30 years, you know. Excellent. Just one, just one minute to get back in your seats, and then we'll have Ravi uh, join on stage to take some of your questions. So just another minute uh, to settle. Well, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, uh, Ravi. This is always our favorite portion of the evening to take your questions. And we have lots of questions that have come in online and uh, that are being voted on. Continue to do that. Uh, and we would love to take uh, questions for Ravi here in person as well. So if you have uh, a question, please go to the media booth uh, just back here. And it uh, seems like a line is starting to form uh, there. And uh, Ravi always particularly loves uh, responding to questions live where he can see the person eye to eye. So please uh, go. That's great. And uh, form a line for your questions. If you've ever had the uh, social fantasy of inviting people to ask questions and then turning to Ravi Zacharias to provide the answers, uh, I'm getting to live that social fantasy uh, right now. And as we're forming a line here, we'll start off with the top uh, vote getting question uh, online. So people voting from all around the world and and this is the uh, top question at the moment, Ravi. It says, even if moral values are indeed objective and knowable, people still disagree. How do we know which values should apply to everyone and be enforced by law? Is it just don't hurt anyone else? Uh, the last part is impossible. <clears throat> It's impossible to have a moral framework and not to offend somebody. But that's a great question in a pluralistic society. And this is what I think, as a nation, we have to come to terms with. And that is this. What formed the roots of this nation? OK, so let me talk proximately first, and then we can expand on that. If you look at roots, trunk, and branches, what forms the roots? What forms the trunk? What forms the branches? The roots are the source of our values, what we are anchored in. So when you go back even to the Declaration of Independence, and it talks about the truths being self-evident that we are all created equal, endowed by our creator with unalienable rights, do you know no other worldview would have done that? Muslims would never have said that. Pantheists would never have said that to pursue happiness and liberty coming from uh, some of the other uh, frameworks and the idea of all created equal within the karmic system. We are not equal. We are born at different levels at a different stratified society. But a naturalist would not have said that. A naturalist would not have said endowed by our creator. We are obviously talking about a transcendent uh, source. In, in his book, uh, Russell Kirk, The Roots of American Order, he gives three cities to which America is indebted, Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem. Rome gave to us our legal categories, uh, Athens gave to us our philosophical categories, and Jerusalem gave to us our moral categories. And Russell Kirk reminds us that the legal and the philosophical will go into disarray if we lose the moral. And that's the one which we have actually forgotten what we owe as a debt to Jerusalem. So 
we have to start by knowing our roots have to hold. And the moment we allow pluralism, which is a legitimate pursuit in any culture, by the way, this was not my home culture. I came to this country from a completely different culture. But one of the reasons that drew me here was the roots, the value system. I wanted to take the very values that had been enshrined here. The trunk is the political process and the branches are how it works out in culture. Why are the branches in disarray and the trunk so shattered? Because we've forgotten the roots. See, if pluralism is taken to mean relativism, then absolutes are gone and all values are equally false or equally true. They actually have no, nothing to hold. It is the, the roots that give us that which has to be enduring. So when we talk about a sturdy, steady growing tree as a culture or form, we have to remember what our roots are. And the roots were framed the framing could only have been done. Now, I'm not saying this was a Christian country. That's not what I'm saying. Because people start debating that ad nauseum, and I'm not interested in that debate. What I am saying is that what I'm debating is no other worldview other than the Judeo-Christian worldview would have made a statement such as that. Check it out. It is impossible for any other worldview. Now, what is happening is we have gone away from being endowed by our creator to debunking the creator and mocking the creator, and we actually think we can still give people rights? Rights are based on what is right. Rights are based on what is right. It is right to give people rights. It is right to give minority the rights they would not otherwise have. But all of these are based upon a Judeo-Christian valuation of every human being having got that, getting that possibility. I was speaking in Washington last week and uh, I was sitting next to a senator, uh, I won't name the uh, state which he represented, but as we were sitting and talking, he said, you know, I was raised in a home that uh, uh, I've never met my father till this very day. So I've never seen my dad. I was raised by a single mom and he said, we were in government housing. We didn't even have a home. Today, this man is a senator in the United States. Last night, uh, my wife and I, I went out to see how I would do out of the home for the first time in 72 hours. And so we went and uh, Cracker Barrel was celebrating 50 years. <laughs> so I go wherever they are celebrating, okay? <laughs> So we had some wonderful southern fried chicken and stuff. And my, my wife, Margie, is standing next to me. My sister-in-law, Barbara, was there. And we walk out. And these two ladies sitting on the rocking chair, they go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they pointed. She came up to me and she said, are you Ravi Zacharias? I said, and she started screaming. You know, I mean, people were probably wondering what on earth I was doing to her because she was chatting. And then she looked at Margie and she said, you're Mrs. Zachary? I said, yeah. She said, I'm a bus driver. I'm a bus driver. I go past your office every day. I never dreamed that I would be meeting you someday. She said, I wish I knew you were in there. I'd have bought your dinner for you. There's a senator. Here's a bus driver. What makes this country so unique that you have an opportunity to make a living, to succeed and find happiness in your heart? And it is the duty of the government to make sure, government to make sure the least amongst us are taken care of, protected. All of that I understand, but that comes from the roots. The roots are our values, vertical and horizontal. So yes, we will disagree. Because even if we have objective values, but our culture will never survive if we uproot what it is that builds this. Pluralism is good. If pluralism means relativism, we're in trouble. Wonderful. I do appreciate your pluralism about food, though. Thank you very much. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we have a live question. Go ahead. And yes, sir. Tell us your name as well, please. My name is Douglas DeRosa. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. 
and I'm originally from Brazil. I've been here in this country for 18 years. Wow. My question is, uh, how can us Christians can show the amazing love of Jesus Christ to the world and at the same time showing that the world is wrong on some of their values? And the second part again, please, sir. And how can we show to the world, right. Right. The love even of through Jesus. the love of Jesus Christ, okay. that the world is wrong sometimes? Okay. It's a very practical question and a very real question from the skeptic. Unfortunately, we don't always do well. You know, when, I, when you travel around and you're a little bit of a public person, and things don't go the way you wanted them to go when you're standing in line or buying an airline ticket or suddenly been told you're gonna to have to sit here for five more hours. You know, last week from Washington to Halifax took us 27 hours to get there because we were sitting in airport after airport after airport. And the temptation then is to get upset with the person who's giving you this news as if they had something to do with it. Not. You have to check yourself every moment every day and let the aroma of Christ be seen in what you say, how you say it. None of us will ever be perfect. So I want to give you two ends of the spectrum here. When Jesus chose the leader of the church, he chose one who actually denied him. It's amazing to me. The one who said, I would never deny you, but denied him three times. And Jesus said, upon your confession, upon what you said, I will build my church. He took the weakest among them, the most talkative among them, who always had a question for every situation, and made him the, the rock, that confession, the rock. Uh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So in spite of our frailties, God sees something good that he can do in us and through us. That's been there across history. One of the greatest early apologists was Augustine. Augustine was a sensually driven man. He lived with constant lusting, and yet God made him that early apologist, and so much is now dependent on so much he wrote in the early days of Christendom. But it is our responsibility to start with your inner life. So my question to you each morning would be, have you had your time with the Lord today? That would be the question you have to ask yourself. Because when you start the day with him, the eyes see the world through contact with him. When you don't start the day with him, you will end up actually making a mess of a lot of things. And you'll start seeing him through the eyes of the world. So you discipline your own inner life. Secondly, it has to spread to your family. How you honor the members of your family, how you treat them. And then, even to those who hate you and persecute you, return in kind. Always love and pray for those who might stand against you. It may be your co-worker who makes fun of your belief. That's okay. But the day will come when you're off the map for him, that person will say, Mr. DeRosa, who worked next to me, was the finest man whom I ever met in all of the years that I worked, be a shining light in a dark world. I'll close with this. When I was in California a couple of weeks ago, a couple came up to me and they said, we live in a very dark world, my husband and I. We work in the industry of video games. My husband and I work here in, they were in Santa Barbara somewhere, work in video game industry. She said, it's a very dark place and the tears were running down her face. She said, what you spoke today, I needed to hear. And I said, if God has put you in a dark place, the light should shine brighter and make sure you're always in the place God wants you to be. Honor your calling and be a bright light. Don't lose hope. Years will go by and you will find out how much the salt and light you really were. You'll find that to be better than you think. Okay? God bless. Hey, my name is Stephen Delos Rios. Uh, my question is, 
when you look at the value systems and, and the values of this world, um, what breaks your heart? Mm. A lot of things. A lot of things. One of the privileges and pain of being alone in a hotel room half your life is you get a lot of time to think. And sometimes when I think of what I've just seen that day walking past people and what they have been doing. You know, our whole uh, ministry called Wellspring International started when Michael and I were in uh, Bombay, I believe it was, Bombay or Calcutta, we were walking many years ago. And I had heard, in Bombay, I'd heard that there were women there in cages being marketed as prostitutes. It was Bombay, now called Mumbai. And I said, that's not true. He said, yes, it is true, I've seen it. I said, I've lived in India, I've never seen anything like that. Rabi Maharaj, the author of the book, The Death of a Guru, uh, he and I are, are good friends. He said, Rabi, next time you're in Bombay, go and see it. I said, name the street. He gave me the name of the street. So next time we arrived in Bombay, Michael and I were together. I said, Michael, do you mind if I ask this taxi driver to take us to that street? We won't get off. And what he said was frighteningly true. They were not cages, but they were bars that they were standing behind. And for about 200 rupees, which would be four to five dollars, the workers would come and buy them for a little bit of the pleasure. Most of them were imported from somewhere else in the country. And I saw that and I, I couldn't, couldn't hold back the tears. She's somebody's daughter, she's somebody's mother. So when I see the marketing of flesh like that, and that's when the Wellspring International was started, that's one area that really troubles me, that people could plunder a life such as that. But the second thing that really bothers me very much is what we are doing with our children. Not only in their mother's womb, which by the way is the most dangerous place to live in America today, but what we are doing in their education. Taking away any moral sense, what are we going to do with these kids when they grow up? So the victimization of people in their bodies and the victimization of children today are two of the things that really, really bother me and break my heart. Now, the passion of our heart is to present the gospel, so that goes across all age brackets. I speak in villages that are illiterate. I speak in high-tech companies. I speak in political leadership. The message is the same, the vessel in which I bring it, and as a team we bring it, will change. Sometimes we as a team will sit down after, when we went to Angola prison, you sit down in silence, you know, you look at each other and say, what have we just been through? So I just say to you, there's a lot to break your heart, like our Lord who looked at the city and wept. And that's what he said to Jonas, you we, Jonah, you're weeping over a plant that has died overnight must I not care about these cities as well. But one last thing I would say, which may be at the root of it all, I mourn what the church has done to itself. In our desperate effort to be relevant, we may have compromised a lot of truth. We exalt communication and brilliance and all the other things we have access to. Where is the truth of the gospel in all of this? And if we lose the gospel, as C.S. Os Guinness would say, if relevance becomes irrelevant, if truth has become irrelevant. So I think we have to bear in mind that the book of the law has not been lost out there, it's been lost in the house of the Lord. If the church recovers its message and its method, I think society will change because there are no other answers out there. There are no answers out there. There's just a lot of questions and a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. So you hang in and see what burden God lays on your heart. There's so many burdens. You honor the burden he places on your heart and lighten the load in that particular area. Mm -hmm. God will use you. Hi, Robbie. My name is Luke Bell. My question is, how do we respond to people like Sam Harris who by citing specific Old Testament laws, 
claims that the Bible is rife with immorality and we can therefore not derive genuine morality from it. Well, he's not the only one, of course. Uh, Sam Harris, uh, who Dawkins said, be answered the question of where we find our morality. When I read Harris's book, I said, what on earth is Dawkins talking about? There are no answers. He just talks about our well-being, and uh, the question is why? Why should I seek my well-being? Why can I just seek my... He's playing God in telling us what well-being is. Now, with all due respect, these are bright minds, these are sharp minds, and uh, uh, are we allowed to talk, Ruth, about the program that's coming out on the 21st? Yeah. Uh, on the 21st, <laughs> because we were cautioned not to. I've just finished an interview with Ben Shapiro, and that'll be played uh, on the 21st. And Ben and I talked about his friendship with uh, Sam Harris. You know, I won't describe what exactly Ben said, but uh, he, Ben, of course, is a very much a conservative person as far as our morals are concerned. Here's what I say. Anybody can take a fragment of any material and make it seem idiotic if they know how to do it well. I can take any worldview and make it look totally idiotic if I chose to. The Bible is a progressive revelation from a covenant relationship to a particular people to moving beyond to the death on the cross and the gospel going out to the Gentiles, to take one pack, pack boy passage in a covenant relationship, if he is going to take that portion to be true, then he also has to say the proliferation of miracles was true. You can't selectively say this destructive command is true, but the miracles are not true. They all come in the context of the abundance of God's intervention. And when you have a plurality of miracles intervening in your life, and you're cautioned not to violate all that evidence, then when the judgment comes, you can't say, ah, this is unfair. Because with the proliferation of miracles came the abundance of responsibility. When that responsibility was not there, the judgment was just as cataclysmic as the intervention of the miracle was. So he has to take it in the whole context, not just pull out something like that. As for Dawkins, who uh, thinks very much of the Harris uh, uh, thesis as well, you know, Dawkins knocks God in talk, talking about him as being this and that, a series of appellates that describe him as being cruel and murderous and genocidal. I don't have the vocabulary he has to say all of that stuff. But he doesn't believe that God exists. <laughs> so if that God exists, doesn't exist, who's he talking about? He's talking about us, humanity. But he already said there's no such thing as evil. Talk about digging a grave verbally. He says, this is the kind of God that is, but then he says, this God doesn't exist, so that means evil exists in your heart and mind. We are the ones who are the genocidal people. But then he turns around and says, there's ultimately no such thing as good or evil. We are all dancing to our DNA. What happened to his original thesis? This self-destructive philosophy of, uh, John, Norm Geisler used to say, most of his opponents were better at smelling rotten eggs than laying good ones. <laughs> and say, go out there, go around sniffing out all these problems, decontextualize them, and make them look like a straw man. That's not who our God is. Why doesn't he talk about the cross and the evil that Christ came to overcome and for forgiveness? So Sam Harris and these others who are trying their best to give a naturalistic explanation for evil None of them has come out with one iota of a positive, logical, rational defense of what good and evil are all about. They just change the terminology and change the terms. The best-known atheist, Richard Rorty, and even a person like Russell admitted, you can't really talk about these categories and go of good and evil without an ontic referent of a vertical, transcendent point of reference. It all becomes self reflecting language, and I don't believe that's what good and evil really are. Yep, okay, thank you. Ravi, we have time for one final 
uh, question. But let me say, if you haven't had your question answered uh, here in person, there's a number of the team in the room. And just off here to the left of the stage, we'll gather at the end of the event, and, and we'll stay as long as anyone else wants to stay uh, and ask questions. And if you're watching online uh, as well, I'd encourage you to go to RZIM Connect. Uh, you can Google uh, RZIM Connect. That will take you there. But we think it's actually better than Google uh, for your faith questions. Uh, that is our <laughs> <laughs> that, that's our online community. And you can ask a question there about faith, uh, any deep question of life. And you'll probably have several answers that will be responded to you within 24 hours or so. So check out RZIM Connect as well. And I think it's a great question to end on, Ravi. The question is, what are some of the practical ways to turn around the values of one's life for humans who are too weak and powerless to change themselves? Wow. Thank you for asking that. I know why you're using the word values. And if I may just tweak it a bit, it was actually Nietzsche who took the step from moral reasoning to the transvaluation of values. He, pre he preferred to use that word values. And it's a good word. But the fact of the matter is, it's beyond values to sound moral reasoning. Gertrude Himmelfarb has written a book Paths, Roads to Modernity. She is this great thinker from Columbia University, now professor emeritus, a great scholar in culture. In her book, Roads to Modernity, she has an amazing chapter, so surprising, that I've had so many people write to me, even before I bought it, and said, get this, get this. She has a chapter dedicated to the impact of John Wesley and George Whitfield on the United States. And here's what she says. The difference between the United States and the United Kingdom on one side and Europe on the other side is for the Europeans, ra reason, rationalism was supreme. Reasoning, the ability to reason. And so you get all of these isms from empiricism to rationalism to postmodernism to existentialism. All of these isms were birthed in Europe. The great philosophers of Europe, particularly uh, in more mid middle times from Germany and France, prior to that, the Italian philosophers and so on. But for them, reason was supreme. It was the pinnacle of how to answer questions. For America and England, it was not so. It was moral reasoning. That's what made America and the United Kingdom different. And Himmelfarb's point is the impact of Wesley and Whit Whitfield was huge in the evangelical message that came to this country. And what was the message? The new birth. That was the message. Wesley repeatedly preached that message that you must be born again. That took on pejorative terms for these sophisticates who don't like what it actually means. But what it actually means is in the flesh, in the way you and I are, we simply not only don't have the ability, oftentimes we lack the will, the will to be right. We have more the will to power and the will to autonomy. But so it's not just so much that we don't have the power to do this, we give up even having the desire to do this. If you go to a Buddhist doctrine, they tell you all suffering will end if you cease to desire. Of course, stones don't desire anything. <laughs> the human being has a will of volition and Jesus said you must hunger. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. And how does this come about? This comes about with the new life that God puts in you. The new birth. But when, uh, when Pilgrim talks about coming to the celestial, to, to the hill called Calvary, that burden falls off. The burden of sin rolls off and the first angel says to him, son, thy sins be forgiven thee, the angel of dawn. Then you've got the angel of noonday that puts the mark on the forehead and a robe, new life, 
is now going to be demonstrated. You are now a marked person for the kingdom. And the angel of dusk gives a scroll and that scroll to give him directions to the eternal city. How brilliant is that? From a tinker who talked about the three realities once you come to Calvary. Sin falls off. You have a new mark and a new garb given to you and you're given the directions of how to get to the celestial city. So the only way your life and mine can change is if it starts with that bag, bag falling off our shoulders. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. We may not all be as bad, but we're all as badly off. And those of us listening, those of you listening, I just say to you, even though you and I may not be eyeball to eyeball, I want to say to you, your problem and my problem is not out there. We're not running from anything out there. We're running from what's in here, the sinfulness of the human heart. Take that heart and put it into the hands of the only one who knows what to do with it. And then he fills you with the power of the Holy Spirit to give you the strength new hungers, new strength, and a new destination. You are now heading towards that celestial city. So I, just, so I just leave this thing with you. Whatever else I know or don't know, I have spent a lot of years studying the plurality of religious worldviews. I've spent a lot of my time reading the sacred texts of other worldviews. None has the story of the gospel and what the woman of the well found and what the prodigal son actually found. And so I wish I could have it. I normally keep it in my pocket. You know, I keep wearing the same jacket all the time. Then when I change it, I find I don't have what I thought I had. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but I have, a car, I have a little bit of that on my night table. In Angola prison, we are meeting people who are on death row. Okay. And as we hear this voice ringing out, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So I walk over and I see this big booming voice of this man. And I stand in front of him and watch him finish the song. And I look at his bed. It's covered with crosses. It's what he does all day. He makes crosses. And as I looked at the guard standing there, wiping the tears away, he gave me two of those crosses. And then he said, I've also done a painting. I want you to have it. And he gave me that painting sitting upstairs in my office. I don't know what he did. I'd imagine it's pretty bad. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Ladies and gentlemen, whether it's a king or a pauper, the answer is still the same. It's not the titles the world gives you. It's the crowning that God is willing to give you and me and call us his children. In your own strength, you will never succeed. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Strive and strive and strive, and you will fail. Surrender. Like a baby is fighting you, you know, I have a few grandkids like that. <laughs> and then suddenly they relax, and the head is on the shoulder, and there's such a treat to hold in that. Relax in the arms of God. You will never be perfect, but you have a destination in that direction. O oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. I forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to bear. O oh, to be like thee, O oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep in my heart. He calls us in that direction. You may not have reached all the way, but with his strength, he'll get you there till when you get to heaven, you'll be the most surprised one of all that he did it. Don't lose heart. And by the way, can I close with this? 
Thank you so much. I never thought I'd be able to make it today, frankly. I had two very, very difficult days. In fact, two nights ago, my wife said to me, you have absolutely no voice. I didn't even have a whisper. I got up at 11 o'clock at night and started gargling. I said, am I going to be able to speak? Plus the demands of surgery lets you know you're mortal and you cannot do what you wish when you wish you do when the body tells you to do what you have to do. So I didn't know I'd be here, but I bet I felt good. So I'm going to go home and have a good plate of dinner now. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting me. Please, please pray. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I just ask?